Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 92. Thanks so much for joining me. We have a special guest today. Michael Mark is here on the line. We'll get to him in just a moment. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too, so please click the like button and make sure you're subscribed wherever you're watching this. There's something you can click, so do click it now, and that would be much appreciated. That way, like your friends and people like that uh, can know to come and watch the show, which is uh, what we want to do here. We want to spread poetry around the internet. Now, uh, today's guest, like I mentioned, is Michael Mark. We interviewed Michael... Uh, is the featured poet in Rattle Number 71, the spring issue that just came out. He's one of my favorite people. He's had poetry published all over the place, but has never published a book of poetry, so we're going to have to get on his case about that. He's had poems published just all over the place, in The Sun and Plowshares, The New York Times, Verse Daily, American Life and Poetry. He's the author of two fiction books uh, back in the day. He lives uh, with his wife Lois in San Diego. And uh, he's just one of my favorite people in the poetry world. So it's a pleasure to uh, talk to him and share some of his poetry this week. Here he is, Michael Mark. Hey, Michael, how are you doing today? Hey, Tim. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you. Yeah, it's just always my pleasure. Um, <laughs> do you want to start out with a poem? Yeah, sure. Um, Mother's Day was just this Sunday. So um, in honor of, of mothers, and in particular mine, uh, who, um, who passed away almost three years ago. Uh, had Alzheimer's and incredible light. This this woman's a su- such an inspiration for me, and she still inspires me. And this is for for mom. Visiting her in Queens is more enlightening than a month in a monastery in Tibet. For the fourth time, my mother asks, "How many children do you have?" I'm beginning to believe my answer to mom is wrong. Maybe the lesson is they are not mine, not owned by me, and she is teaching me about my relationship with her. I wash my dish and hers. She washes them again. I ask why. She asks why I care. Before bed, she unlocks and opens the front door. While she sleeps, I close and lock it. She gets up, unlocks it. What I have, no one wants, she says. I nod. She nods. Are we agreeing? My shrunken guru says she was up all night preparing a salad for my breakfast. She serves me an onion. I want her to make French toast for me like she used to. I want her to tell me about, I want her to tell, I want to tell her about my pain, and I want her to make it go away. And I want the present to be as good as the past she does not remember. I toast white bread for her, butter it, cut it in half. I eat a piece of onion. She asks me why I'm crying. Yeah, and that was a great poem. That was from The Sun, mm-hmm. uh, originally published there. That was visiting her in Queens is more enlightening than a month in a monastery in Tibet. And um, so to start off, Michael, you know, you've had such an interesting life, I think. You, you know, you owned your own advertising agency. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you've gone all over the world and, and stuff. And so the thing that I'm, I find fascinating is that you spend so much time on poetry, given the richness, you know, and not only that, but you also work in hospice. Yeah. Um, you, you do, there's so much that you do. So what is it that you get out of poetry that keeps you sitting down at the table every day? Or oh, in front of the God. computer or your phone, as you mentioned, your special uh, technique for writing. Yeah. Um, well, I don't feel like I've done as much as you, th- you say. Um, I think I live a very small life. I think a poetry um, allows me a lens by which to examine, um, which to feel and to ex- explore what I feel, what I think perhaps I project, I know I do, or what others might feel and think. It's, um, it's, I find it very active. Mm-hmm. You know, you would think that you sit down and you write or you just read. But I find that um, the exploration uh, takes me to places I would have never expected. Uh, so I learn and I, and, and, and I take in. More than I, I think I express, I take in. 
Yeah. And and were you writing I, I were you writing sort of continuously throughout your life as you worked yeah. in other fields or did you sort of pick it up after you retired? Yeah, well, um I wrote before we had kids. Mm-hmm. Not to make the kids feel guilty. I love you guys. But um the last time I wrote was the night before our, our first Alex was born. And I still have the date on it. And then he was born and then we went to work and we had to do what we had to do and we're happy we did it. Um, and, um, and then we went back to it after I, uh, I got out of work after I, I sold the agency. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It's so cool to hear you say that. Cause that, that's the same thing that happened to me. We had a, I published a book in 2009 mm. and my last like blog post that I like thought of myself as a writer trying to have a blog and promote a book. I was like, here's my book. And wow. then a couple months later, I was like, here's our baby. And then I kind of didn't really write much for a long time yeah. because uh, it's just your priorities change, you know, and, 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 and life con- gets in the way and, and it's a good thing, but uh, it, it changes, I don't know, your focus or something. Oh, it does. I mean, and, and something you can't prepare for, at least I wasn't prepared for. And Lois and I were married for, for eight years before we had Alex. So our rhythm was, was strong. Um, but, um, you know, we got lucky and, and, uh, and, and, wasn't going to put other things in in front of it, so uh, or him in this case. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah. Well, let's hear another poem. Let's kind of keep the ball rolling on some All poems right. here. Well, speaking of Alex and Sarah, um, they they recently got married, both within the last uh, two years. And um, I, I was thinking about as they were making their decisions on partners, um, I would give them advice, which of course they never asked for. And um, and uh, I wrote this poem. And um, they did great. I mean, um, you know, uh, we, we are so blessed to have Julie and Sierra um, and, uh, in our family. So uh, this is also like a Mother's Day poem. This is about um, Lolo, my, Lois, and uh, why, I, why I love her, why I married her. Hershey Bar Girl. Marry a girl who lays down on her grandfather's grave. So on his first night, he won't be afraid. Give her the ice cream test. When she refuses Godiva for good humor, promise you'll obey. You'll die a little, watching her pump regular over high test, spidering the hot hood to squeegee bug guts and trucker spit off the windows. You'll weep as she buffs the mirrors back to new. Quit school. Leave work, shut the Bible, but don't buy her bottled water. She'll keep it in the fridge, front shelf, unopened, to remind you every day of your life what real is. And that was Hershey Bar Girl uh, by Michael Mark. And that would appear yeah. in Sow's ear. Yeah, Lois likes Hershey Bars over anything. You know, like uh, we're, 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 we're from Queens. I married a girl from Queens and got lucky. 39 years. Um, that's one of the things I wanted to ask about because your your poems. I think that what I love about your poems is that they feel so intimate and sort of honest, like a personal look at your life. Like they, they feel like you get to like I feel like I know you really well just by reading the poems you've submitted over the years, and we've published I think maybe five of them or so. Seven, uh, seven. There you go. Don't cheat me. <laughs> Correct the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so so. Um, you know, how is it that you you approach that, like publishing poems um, that that are very intimate and personal? Do you think about that? Do you do the people in your life that you write about? Um, you know, do you, do you worry about le- putting yourself on display in that way? Ooh. Oh my gosh, you're hitting on all cylinders, my friend. Yeah, I do worry about it. We have a lot of conversations about it. I mean, being a family poet is what I think of myself because my my reference isn't great. I don't. I haven't read up until now all that much. Um, I've had great life experiences. I'm very fortunate, but um, my sources are few, and uh, I find family uh, very rich. Um, and so, when I tap into that, um, it affects the family. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's there's some tension about that. Um, there's tension about whether I write about my mom, the fact that she has Alzheimer's. They talk about my father. I mean, talk about my children. And so, I mean, I know I read Sharon Old many times talk about that. And she's the greatest, in my estimation, certainly contemporary um, family-type poets. And um, 
and she struggles with that or has struggled with that. So yeah, I'm very sensitive to it. Um, what I feel from that is that, you know, it's like um, what I'm affected by, if it truly affects me, if, if on the page it vibrates or has a color, whether I'm writing about my family, I feel like I'm writing about your family. I feel like there's that humanity that, that if I can connect into that, um, it's a worthwhile you know, endeavor to write the poem and to share the poem. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hurt anybody by, by revealing, but there must be some, you know, revelation. Uh, so um, it's dangerous territory. Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever published a poem that, uh, that, that somebody was upset by later or, uh, or yes. have, you, have you been able to balance that? Yeah. Yeah, I have, I have, I have. I've also uh, submitted a poem and it was accepted and I looked at it again. I said, no, I better not. And I, I, and, and the person was very gracious to say, I said, let's not publish this one. And um, so, yeah, it's, I struggle with it. Yeah. Well, that's a great point too, just for people watching out there that, that's come up a few times. I think like when you get the acceptance notice, for, you know, from some magazine, you're, you're tempted to say, oh, that's great. Let's do it. And ignore those kind of reservations that's come come up a few times in my uh my experience where i've somebody said like oh i don't know if i should publish this and i'm like well definitely don't <laughs> you know well that's great advice and i don't know that i i i know when the definitely comes up i just don't think i do because i think that wow this really, like i have written some poems about because of my hospice volunteering um that were very personal never mentioning names no names mm -hmm. but it comes up and then i'll get you know, letters from the publication, some like at a Bellevue, which is published by a NYU Medical School, saying how much it helped their 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 family members to understand something. But I do know it made somebody in the family uncomfortable. Same thing happened with the son, with that you know, with poems. So um, we have to we have to um, uh, navigate that. And, and and I don't know that I'm always the best captain. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, hey, Michael, you froze on the screen. I'm going to hang up and call you back. I was trying to, waiting to see if it would unfreeze. This is mostly oh. recording for a podcast for the audio version, so it doesn't really matter too much if we only have audio, but it'd be nice to see you too. So I'm going to hang up and just call you right back and see if that fixes okay. it. Okay. Should I just leave it alone and not do anything? Yeah, just don't do anything. Just answer when I call you back. Okay. Okay. Let's see if this works. So, um, yeah, that, that hasn't happened in a long time, uh, but we'll call Michael right back. We'll cut this out of the audio version. And see if it see if it fixes it. There you are. You're back live. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's, that, it takes just two seconds to fix. So. Um, All right. Well, so, so. I was very good at the robot back in the, uh, <laughs> in the in those days. So maybe I was doing the robot. Well, I was wondering. I was wondering because I, you know, maybe yeah. you just throw, you know, <laughs> throwing us for a loop. Um, anyway, let's hear another poem. And I should say that if, if anybody has any questions for uh, Michael, feel free to answer them or ask them in the chat messages either on YouTube or Facebook. I'm watching both. Uh, you know, all of our subscribers had read the interview with Michael. It's kind of like the A.E. Stallings uh, uh, podcast that we did where uh, try not to go too much in the background because you can find that all in the issue. Uh, but if you have any you know, questions that feed off of what Michael was talking about when we had that interview uh, in that spring issue, feel free to ask questions, anything you want. Michael is here at your disposal. But uh, in the meantime, let's hear a, uh, another poem, Michael. Okay. Um the, uh, you're you're going to all meet my family. Um, so now we're, we're going to talk about my dad. We talked about my mom and uh, and and uh, some uh, my wife. Um, and dad is going to be on Friday, ninety five years old. Oh wow! And, happy uh, birthday to him. So I think we should all sing Happy Birthday to Dad. Happy Birthday to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll stop it. I love you, Dad. Um, this is a sad poem. This deals with celebrating his birthday. This is um, called Celebrating. His 92nd birthday, the year his wife died. He goes to Ben's Deli because the waitress doesn't ask how he is. He takes most of the corned beef from the sandwich, piles it on the edge of the plate, makes a thinner one with enough left for two nice ones at home. The waitress packs his leftovers extra slices of rye and half-sour pickles in wax paper and two mustards in squat cups. She never removes the other setting. She lets him sit as long as he wants. Yeah, that beautiful short poem, celebrating his 92nd birthday, the year his wife died. 
And, um, you know, that poem was so um, condensed. I, I was wondering, hearing you listen to it, how, was that originally how long it was? Like, what is your writing process like? Do, do, yeah. you, do you rework and rework poems a lot? Or is that sort of how it came out? No, rarely does it come out. I think that one came out pretty close. Um, I write documentary. I mean, this is, this is our life. So uh, I tend to go overboard a great deal. Um, and I'm working on concision. So thank you for recognizing that in that poem. Um, but uh, I, I'm prosaic in nature. I'm working on the lyric. I try to get in, into the more spiritual and leaps. But um, oftentimes I go much longer, many, many lines. And as far as rewriting, um, I rewrite things long after they're published, mm -hmm. um, trying to get them right. And especially because I, I, I mean, I'm taking liberties because, you know, I take, I take from our family and I mess with it. And I, and, and there are people, my dad in this case, and my mom, uh, that I'm beholding to. So I want to get it right. Um, I rewrite, I probably write before I send anything out most probably about 60 times every word. Probably, because mm -hmm. I learned that from John Gardner when I got my master's, but I was in fiction, so I think I'm I'm a recovering fiction writer, you know. You've yeah. also uh, you, you've taken uh, creative writing courses, or, or, or uh, I don't yeah. know if it's is it MFA programs, three separate MFA programs, or are they various? Well, I, the, the, I, I've I've uh, tapped into and uh, snuck into three different MFA programs. It's true. Uh, I really enjoy Pacific, Warren Wilson, and San Diego State. And um, I know that's odd, um, <laughs> and, but I get to learn a little bit, and then I sneak out, and I get to learn a, a lot. And I, I learned from all three programs. It was, and, and I still will continue to. Maybe I'll go back to one. Maybe I still continue. I just, um, I like to explore, and I've had a remarkable time uh, learning from the professors, the, the poets, as well as the poet student poets. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you talked about having seven poems in rattle, which is close to the record. I think, I think. Uh... I'm not sure who has the record. It might be Tony Glogler, your friend. He's up there. He's great. Yeah, but you rejected me. You, I don't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. Listen. There's my queens coming out. But, I, you know, I think it was like 16 times before I had my first acceptance. Yeah, it, it happens. You know, you kind of yeah. got to find the right niche or something. But I wanted to ask you, though, since you're, um, I was going to say, like, you know, you've had a lot of poems in rattle. You also had a lot of um, MFA experience. Uh, what is the the thing that you've, like, what have you learned the most from those experiences versus just being a reader of poetry and enjoying poetry? Um, is there something that you sort of get out of those experiences? And there's there a certain program that was the best? How how did how were they for you? Yeah. Okay. I, I have a question about MFA programs too. So we're gonna go back and forth a little bit on this. I cannot tell you where I learned most. I mean, I'm working at S San Diego State with Blas Falconer. He is a remarkable poet and teacher. Uh, how he goes around the workshop room and works at everybody's level is inspiring. Um, and he's given me so much of his time, and he's taught me concision. He really works on, with me on concision and being delicate. Uh, I worked with um, Alan Shapiro, and he, he just said about uh, trusting his and reading more. Reading is particularly things that I don't like. So he forced me to go into areas that I was uncomfortable. And the Pacific, you know, Kwame Dawes and Dorian Locks, um, they just pushed me to uh, to really read the writers <laughs> on some level, op not opposite of Alan, but read the writers who write that I want to write like. So I, I mean, I, I was getting a smorgasbord, and I was just, uh, I, 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 I became like a pig. I just kept on eating. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, here's but a I question. I want to ask you about that. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, go I'm going to interview. I'm going to switch to MFA versus um, what I want to call it, what academic poets versus street poets. Mm -hmm. do, do you get more submissions and publish more what you would call MFA program writers or regular or what I would call regular? Pardon me for the the, the terminology, but you know what I'm saying. Academic. No, I do, yeah. and, and that's the thing. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's so many like like you. It, it's it's shocking. I was actually talking to who was I talking to? Oh, Francesca Bell who yeah, I think you know. I was I talking it. to her, yeah. maybe privately, but uh, I think I'll she might if I say this, but she was uh, the poetry editor at River Sticks for a little while. And she was saying how she could not believe how, like what percentage of the poets submitting were MFA graduates, you know? Ooh. Like, and, and that's the case. It's just there. It's, it's like, you would think maybe it's like 50, 50, if you just thought, I don't know what you would think, 
But um, it ends up, it, it's like 80, 90%. It's a lot of poets who, um, you know, have that as like their their sort of g- career goal, you know? Uh, so it's the well, majority, I would say. Career-wise, it's a terminal degree, right? So you could teach college with that degree. Yeah, so I yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah you but could, you, but, but the problem but, is that there's so many people who uh, want to teach college. You know, there's way more uh, qualified people than jobs, which is the big problem right, right. with the MFA. Uh, Michael, you keep freezing again. I'm so sorry. I'm going to hang up and call you back one more time. Hopefully we get this mm. settled out. It, it's weird because it's never happened before, but let's uh, yeah. let's get this fixed here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. We just keep, uh, I guess we didn't do our test during the day. I guess a lot of people are streaming Netflix in Michael's neighborhood or something. Okay. Let's see. We're back and let's see. Is that, that's much better now. Well, hopefully we'll see how long it buffers this time. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing that, uh, we were talking about MFA programs yeah. and, uh, and, and yeah, there's so many people who do it. There's so many, uh, you know, there's that, um, we had Dana Joy on and he wrote that, uh, essay. Uh, what's that essay called? I can't, I'm drawing a blank right now. The, um, um I don't know, but I, I watched that, 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 that video. Um, yeah, his yeah. essay from the nineties. What was it called? Yeah. Someone else say mm-hmm. in the comments, but, uh, but he was talking about how even back in like 1998, whenever that was, that there were a thousand people graduating with terminal degrees in creative writing, uh, every year. And so that, you know, every year there's a thousand more to compete with for those kind of jobs. So it's a tough thing to do. You know, I always say, um, it's a great thing for people who don't feel like they need to use that as a career, but it's a tough thing if you want to make it a career. Yeah. Uh, Tony, when I write, sometimes we, he and I share uh, poems back and forth and he'll just, he'll write, Michael, we, what is this MFA crap that, you know, you're writing? And, and because he believes that the heart and soul is in is in the the, the storyline. I mean, he, of course, his line breaks and all his, his diction. He's terrific, but he believes when I get too clever, it it saps the poem, and he believes that's an MFA affliction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do, but, do, um, do you think it's yeah. affected you that way? Do you think you've had like because the, there's that whole idea of the Mick poem? Um, is that? Uh, I mean, obviously it hasn't because I read your poem. I don't. But. I don't think it has. But I. I, I but um. I want, I'm so hungry to learn. And then I say, okay, I'll take that, that, I'll take that, and that which I won't, I won't. I mean, I'm at a certain age. I'm 64 years old. I'm not going to be teaching. I, I'm just into the, into the, the learning. I want, I want to, I, so I'm not beholding on some level to it. I don't think that the teachers want you to be beholden. Um, I don't know if it's true what they say that, you know, academic poetry is kind of anemic. I don't know if that's true. Um, so, uh, I, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, well, that, that's one of the things you just you just mentioned that I find. I feel like you are um, like a lifelong student of you know, like a student of life, which is the the thing that's so cool. I mean, because you, you do you know you you focus on Buddhism too. Uh-huh. Um, you know, you you move from different I'm things. Lousy and, at it, but yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I think I, I just saw a quote recently that was like, um, "Anything worth doing is worth doing badly." Yeah. And I thought that was such great advice. I don't know whose quote that is, but, um, but you know, I mean, because once you do it badly long enough, then you do it amazingly <laughs> eventually. And, yeah. and that's the only way to do it. And so uh, if it's worth doing, it is worth doing. But you seem like you confront the world from that space of like that, um, I mean, not necessarily beginner's mind maybe, but, but just a student who, who is willing to accept the, the limitations of what I know and, and, and wanting to learn. Well, that's nice to hear. I think it was, I was a very poor student all my life, except when I got into college. And, you know, I, I, I think always not knowing, like, even, like Zimborska, she calls herself a poet of, of, of not knowing. And that's what she gave her speech on when she accepted the Nobel. I, and I subscribe to that. And I love her. She's one of my favorite, if not my favorite poet. Um, and the unknowing brings in questions and brings you close to something and then you get to look at it but if you know what do they say it's a buddha saying if you ask an expert something they'll give you the answer ask a novice and they'll give you 100 well let's take some detours <laughs> <laughs> oh, just for everybody who, who's watching along, is, is can poetry matter is the dana joy essay some oh, some right. people mentioned the poetry's enchantment which is what we were talking about which is a great essay too but uh, that Can Poetry Matter was from 1997 or 94 or something like that, talking about the professionalization of poetry and the effects mm-hmm. it has on sort of the economy of poems. Um, but, but one of the things that was fascinating talking to you was um, your experience and how you came to Buddhism. 
And um, I just love that story, which I won't have you retell because people can find it in the issue. But but how does Buddhism um, affect your poetry? It, it, do you feel like Buddhism is a sort of meditative practice and part of the the, the way? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really that, Tim. I do. I, I think that it allows you to settle and be and and watch and witness. Even though I talk about poetry as an action, it is, or maybe it really is a reaction. There's some dialogue, there's some there's nerve endings that are synapsing. And with Buddhism, it, it asks a wonderful amount of questions. What? Is that true? Is that so? Is this a chair? What makes it a chair? I mean, if this is a table, what makes it a table? If I take out the legs, is this a table? If I take out the top, is it a table? So it just, it happened. Again, you get to look at it again and again and again and again and again. So it, it's a great prompt. I, I stink at prompts. <laughs> but that's a pretty good problem, too. Yeah, that, that would be. Uh, let's hear another poem. Okay. This is one that you took. So I have a question for you at the end of this, too, if you don't mind. Okay, um, yeah, sure. This is about, um, this was a poet poet response poem uh, the, about the shooting in the uh, temple in San Diego, 2019. And a woman was uh, killed and others were badly hurt. And... Um, uh, what happened is that I was in the ballpark uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle school, and on it was Saturday, which we call Shabbos. Jews call Shabbos. It's a high holy day. And then, um, there was a stranger there, and then this news came on my phone, and it was me. So that's what started the poem. Jews in the wrong place in San Diego. So I get up from the metal benches, walk the concrete path around the ball field to watch updates on my phone and a small man coming. He has a big potato nose and those thick glasses and I do what walkers do, step a half step over, make room and smile. He touches his heart with his palm, holds it over his pale polo shirt above his wide belly. My legs keep their pace so he doesn't see the tears he made me make. He makes the bullets, the people, real, makes me a mourner, a witness, maybe a human, and us a them. The temple is only 15 miles away on this beautiful Saturday, Shabbos, beautiful girls and boys playing t-ball. He touches his heart, makes the bullets real, the faces, screams. I know he is a Jew. His size, his shape, the thin gold chain around his neck, thick Jew's neck. If that's wrong of me, then I'm wrong. I can't see it's not a cross or a star or a dead wife's ringing ring hanging from a chain like my father wears. He is a Jew who knows I am a Jew. The next time we meet up on the path, I don't know if I should. I want to touch my heart back. I know I need to. He does it again. Slow pats like slow heartbeats. What if it has nothing to do with the shooting, the murdered woman, the three injured so far reported, the automatic weapon, our history? It's just his way of saying, showing me, this is my heart. It's right here under my chest. Maybe he does that to every person he sees. That's how he says good morning. Every morning, hello at the grocery store, at the dentist. He sl walks slow. Maybe he is sick. Maybe his feet hurt. Maybe he is tired. Maybe it's the mourner's walk. Maybe he is walking with the dead. He's dead, maybe. He's a Jew. I don't want him to leave the park. I turn as he passes, his loose pants, slump, still going. The third time we meet, I see his hands don't have a ring. I want to see him pat his heart, but he doesn't. He gives me a thumbs up, his fist wrapped around his tissue, and I know what he means. I'm sure we're still here. We are at the ball field at the middle school, the wrong place on Shabbos. We're such Jews. We're still here. And that was Jews in the Wrong Place in San Diego from Poets Respond. That was about two years ago, I'd guess, something like yeah. that. 
Um, yeah, yeah, just a, a wonderful poem. That's all your poems are, Michael. <laughs> I don't think all of them, but okay, thank you. <laughs> um, the question I have for you is this. I have two. I have uh -huh. questions for all poets and myself very much. This was a catastrophe. This is a tragedy. And here I am writing a poem, and I cannot tell you a lie here. There, was a, there were moments of joy in writing this poem. And actually, I was saying, wow, this might be good. Oh, this might be good. The woman just got shot. Mm -hmm. Three people were, were shot. This horrific incident. And here I am, and Ed Hirsch has written about this, about what he calls the poet's sickness. We're always looking for things. So how do we navigate this this, this understanding the tragedy, we're commemorating it when we're saying that we don't want to forget this, we want to know this, we want to put this down, not to be forgotten. We want to, we want to honor this moment in the way not to support it, but to say, yes, this happens in our best craft. But we also recognize there is a joy in that. And this dichotomy, this conflict, I'm just curious about that. And what is your responsibility having the, the having giving us a, a prize, if you will, rewarding us with with with, with money and with um with, with, with a publication um, and support. So I'm curious about that. Well, well, to me, I mean, the job of an artist, I, I'd think, I'd say it's not just poetry. It, it's what the job of art is: is to make sense of the chaos of human existence. You know, and there's a sense that there's this like, um, like I think of uh, like a campfire. You know. And so there's a fire in the woods and the darkness of like life, you know, and that's the fire of human knowledge or something. And there's certain things that are like just in the darkness, you know, and, and somehow what an artist does is like bring, like expand the circle that the light reaches, you know, and it, it brings into, to, I don't know, just makes sense out of the stuff that we don't know. And I think that there's a joy in that. I think it's purely, um, like, I think it's evolutionary biology that makes a joy, you know, because we're th that we're driven to do that is what makes us human beings. And, and the, you know, it's like a like salt and sugar taste good, you know, making mm. meaning and understanding the world, because then we can predict what's going to happen next. We can understand how other people feel and re interrelate with them better. Um, there's all these like evolutionary drives that come into play with making meaning out of the world. So, of course, it feels good, um, even if it's, you know, making meaning out of something that's terrible. Um, so that's how I think. Like I think we're contributing to this like big basket of human knowledge and understanding when we're writing and when we're making art of any kind. And so, um, so that's how I think of it. And so you're you're providing that, even though it's a tragic event. It's a tragic event that that we can't really make sense. That we have trouble making sense of. It's like so horrific. It's outside of our understanding. And then we get a little bit of understanding about it, and we relate to different people, and, and our understanding of the world is broadened and enriched by that, and, and I mm -hmm. think that's a good feeling within the bad, because it's yeah, just the way the, the way it works. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's how I justify what we do. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I do I wonder, know. If, you know? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's something that we have to recognize. I mean, I know that I'm always snooping around for, for opportunities, and when I, when I started writing this poem, it... I I was like, wait, what? No, wait, this is not. Mm -mm. But I but I did, and then I didn't submit it to you until eleven fifty nine. I remember <laughs> oh, really? sitting next to Lois, uh -huh. going, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, and I guess I did. And then you wrote me a lovely, especially lovely note about this particular poem, what your experience was about. I, I kept that about about you know you really tearing up. These stuff you said, and I trust that you meant it. <laughs> um, and so I thought, okay. Okay. So, yeah. Interesting. yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's just and, and then you have to um, be honest about it, too. I think, you know, you have to like there's a sense that that you're writing with authenticity versus just writing exploitatively, which comes out in the poem itself. So I think, you know, I mean, that's very important. I, yeah, I, I, I if you look at closely and not even have to write, look at the way I, I punctuate that poem. It's very sloppy, and yeah. it's, it, mm -hmm. it, it's all over the place. I never wrote a poem, and I kept on hearing a voice saying, "Don't fix it." I kept wanting to fix it. I wanted to fix it before I send it in, right? No, don't fix it. Don't fix it. Why? And I didn't have the answer. I just trusted the voice. But if I, it's hard to read that poem because it's the melding. I think that's the melding, the dialogue between the event, the the speaker, the poet, and the the, the person who giving the thumbs up and the tap of the heart. I think all that and the, and that the punctuation shouldn't get in the way. And I don't normally employ that. Hmm. 
Yeah, yeah I know. noticed that too. Like it is a very different style. Um, and I don't remember did I if I fixed some of those or did, I don't know. Did I do that online? Did I you? I don't know that you did. I don't if think so. Did, I think I left it. I don't think it. that you did. Yeah. It's all, that's always something that you have to wonder about too. Is you know where the line is. Like I try to have poems be internally consistent, and that poem is, even though it's missing a lot of the punctuation that that would go in there. Right. Um, but let me, I'm going to, don't get frustrated by this, but I'm going to hang up and call you back again. Cause it's just, uh, that's just oh. the way it is. So, okay, sure. And we'll just cut it out from the audio version. Okay. And if anybody is watching at Michael Mark's house, um, <laughs> cut off your stream and, uh, watch on the replay because, uh, there's a lot less bandwidth than there was on the test call. But let's see, we'll get him and hopefully it'll stick this time. There he is. See, every time we call back and reconnect, it's fine. It just yeah. must be a busy day, so, you know, somewhere in some router or something. Um, but anyway, oh. let, let's do another poem. Um, do you want to do? Okay. What do you want to do next? Um, this is another poem that you took, and, I, and I'd like to ask you a question after that one. So I'll, I'll do this one. Okay, this sure. is about friendship. Uh, I wrote this poem for a friend of mine. Apology, although he's alive, and um, uh, he, he's a poet. Bob and um, when I read it to him, I was all full of emotion. And you know, he looks at it, he takes it from me, he goes, "Yeah, I'd work on this line." I mean, you know, I just pour my heart out. <laughs> Poets, you know, what yeah. are you gonna do? Okay, this is called "Golf with Bob." A romantic might see lovers' footprints, two sets, stride by stride, crisscrossing slopes from tree-sheltered tea boxes in morning's wet grass before they suddenly part. But that was just us, heading off to find our drives, hit our irons, nice one, or uh uh-oh. Then the distinct steps blur, blotch, hurry back to the other's side, move greenward, near enough so a detective or a suspicious wife could imagine hands were held. We weren't even good friends. Our games were just well matched. His power, my strategy. Monday and Wednesday partners. Now I play with whoever's up for a game. On the 14th hole, I still look around. Lose focus by drives wandering into the tall magnolias like Bob's used to. We'd stop and hunt through the small forest. Musty and thick with fallen leaves for as long as it took. Yeah, another great one. There's Golf with Bob. Uh, I think that was from rattle number 62, if I remember right. But who knows? I can't keep track. So <laughs> I, I don't know how you do what you do, 62. Um, but yeah, yeah. So it was Bob, is Bob a poet or is he? Yeah, uh, Bob's, a, Bob's a poet and mm-hmm. a golfer and a great guy. And, and the question I had for you on this poem was – you know, when you get all these poems, I don't know how you read them, Tim. And how do you, I was curious what it was like for you. And I'm speaking on behalf of, I hope, all the poets out there who, who want to be in Rattle, want to understand what you're thinking. You don't get a chance too often to talk to the editor the way I got this chance, so I want to make the most of it. What in this poem made you say, yes, I think we'll, we'll share this poem with my readership? Was there a point where you were saying, I think so? And then, and then there was another point where go, yes. <laughs> I mean, how does that work? Well, you know, you mentioned already um, that you try to find something with color, I think is the phrase you use. Yeah, that, you know, or and a that, vibration. Yeah. yeah, or vibration. Yeah, that, that's the same thing that we just do. I mean, the, the other poem, the the Jews in the Wrong Place, whatever that was called. Yeah. You know, that I, I feel like you could uh, like hook an editor up to a... Um, a, a lie detector test, you know, that piezoelectric effect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you see the goosebumps or the sweat, you know? Mm-hmm. And if there's a physiological reaction, it's a good poem. That's kind of how it works. And I think what it is is we're tapping into like the collective unconscious or something. But so um so the process of reading submissions is just uh I, I compare it to uh listening like trying to find a station on the radio. You know, you're flipping through and it's like static, 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 and then there's music, you know, and then you hear right. music and uh and so just with the first, uh, I could put it up here. Let me see. Uh, so with the first lines, a, a romantic might see lover's footprints to set stride by side, stride crisscrossing slopes from tree shattered tea boxes and morning's wet grass. That's just such a vivid image. And the syntax is so interesting too, that it like hooks you in with the music of the language. So at, so at that point I was like, oh, this is a good poem. 
And then as you read through, you get the, the emotional impact mm. of it. And um, and then I do remember, too, the thought that um, I read that many poems about golf. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I think I have a chance with this. Yeah, it's true. And so so we're looking for stuff that like hasn't been written about, you know, a hundred times. Yeah, and so um, and, and Megan, too, you know, she reads most of the poems and um, and she has this like, I don't know, like like language for her is like some deeper thing that is for me even where she reads really fast and like absorbs it all and then sees the patterns that are in there. And uh, she'll be like, well, this isn't a poem I've seen before, like the structure right. of it somehow. And, um, and that's kind of all that we're looking for something we haven't seen before that gives us something new on the world and makes us feel something. And, uh, and so that, so, you know, you can tell right, right off the bat that it's there. Like you hear mm. it like a radio station coming in, if you're, you know, driving toward a city, right. you know, <laughs> like it's, you're right. the static. All exactly. Yeah. 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 And then, uh, mm. and then it ended up, you, you know, sometimes the poem, every day you must get a lot. You, how many poems do you read a day? And you must get many that do what you just said. And then you have to call it down. Yeah. It's just, you just read and reread, you know, like, like if you have a poem that has the music going or something or something interesting going, then you put it aside and just read it again a week later and see if it still feels interesting. And if it does, and then Megan will read it and she'll write a note about it. And then Alan will read it, you know, at a meeting and he'll say what he thinks. And if we all felt something about it, then we feel, something. then it's, you know, something uh, worth uh, sharing. That's all uh, we do. Uh, uh, any fisticuffs? <laughs> no, you know, cause that's the thing too, with so many poems, like, um, you know, if uh, someone doesn't like one, we're just kind of like, okay, we'll move on to the next, you know? I mean, there's a lot of... Um, well, so you have to have all three saying yes. Yeah, we kind of do. Or, or at all least, right. you know, like, um, you know, I don't, you know, I don't maybe see, I don't love it as much as you, but I see that there's something there. Okay, fine. Right. I'll give it to you this. <laughs> you know, there, there's some I kind mean. of negotiation going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can imagine that's, how it works. And that's, that's exactly how it does. Though. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And, and so for Poet Respond, I read myself. Um, and then some weeks I'll be I think more and more <laughs> the last few weeks, I'll, I'll be like, Megan, Megan, there's these five poems. Mm-hmm. Which one do I pick? <laughs> and so I'll go and uh, walk the dog or something while she reads the five. And then she'll say, oh, this one and this one. And I'll say, OK, thank you so much. Great to have her. So, yeah, yeah, it's great. to. It's sort of a, te- you know, it's definitely a team, uh, team yeah. concept. Um, but uh, let's see. I, I want to... Um, <laughs> yeah, Daniel Mass likes the you interviewing me thing. Um, <laughs> so people appreciate it, I guess. Oh, good. Um, I was trying to find, there was a question here I wanted to ask, but it's buried up in the comments. Where did it go? Um, um, uh, I don't know if I'm going to find it. I think somebody, jeez. I guess why don't you why don't you read another poem and I'll try. Well, to you find read it. another poem. I'll read another poem and you read. Don't yeah, pay attention to what exactly, I'm saying. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Um, so uh, I'll start this off by saying that Lois um, is a travel writer. She's a remarkable travel writer. She writes for Forbes and USA Today. She's right. But 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 um, sometimes you know when you travel, you just you cram a lot in. And this is me being a cranky tourist. It's called Portrait of an Ordinary God. Maybe Jesus never wiped the sweat from his brow with his forearm in the dusty shade of an olive grove or loosed the knot on his robe for comfort. And consequently, such moments are not memorialized in museums on our grand Mediterranean vacation. More likely, Everyday acts of a deity between giving sight to the blind and feeding the masses with two fish pulled from the sand are not the stuff of masterpieces. But wouldn't it be refreshing to see a Tintoretto of the Son of Man stretching out those lithe arms not to embrace all of humankind, but just to ease some cramped muscles after a night washing lepers' sores? Call me a cranky peasant, but every painting in every village, church, or Pope-blessed basilica shows the same two poses, suffering and forgiving. After three countries and five days, I get it. All I want is one portrait of the king of the Jews, sandals slung over his shoulder, cooling his feet in the Galilee. One Renaissance tapestry of him on his back, looking at clouds, daydreaming. 
Jesus may never have skimmed stones on the water's surface while pondering original sin, but couldn't you see him give a thumbs up to his flock, letting them know it's not only going to work out in the end, it's going to be awesome, dude. I'd buy that 15-euro poster, tack it up over the couch in the den, so when the wife says the gutters need cleaning, I'd execute that gesture with practice perfection. Maybe even, a re- maybe even release a pained saintly sigh before I lift and shoulder the ladder. Yeah, another great one. That was uh, Portrait of an Ordinary God. And that made me realize, you know, you travel a lot. And Lois yeah. is a travel writer, so they, yeah, that's why. What a great, uh, what wow. a great spouse. I mean, that's a great, uh, you know, perk maybe. Too. Oh, are you kidding me? I'm a great, I'm a bellboy. I just carry the bags around. Yeah. <laughs> and then you do uh, one of the things that you do is uh, long distance walking. Um, uh huh. Yeah. Do you still do that? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, with COVID, I haven't. But um, Alex and I, uh, we were planning on doing uh, Liechtenstein, and, and 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 but before that, uh, we did Wales, and uh, I've done uh, the uh, Camino uh, twice, or uh, and um, and uh, done uh, some of the Himalayas. Yeah, I and I continue. I want to continue to do that. You know, as I get older, it gets harder to carry. Mm-hmm. 25, 30 pounds on your back, but I'm going to give it another go. And is this like competitive? Is it like a, like a marathon type thing where multiple people are doing it or is it just, Oh no, I don't do it with multiple people. I go Uh alone most of the time. Sometimes I like with Alex, we we did Wales. We did a place called Office Dyke. And we, he and I started with, um, uh, some of the uh, Camino and uh, uh, my wife, uh, my wife, my daughter uh, Sarah. She did the Camino by herself mm-hmm. um, without me. Um, not that I, you know, I felt bad about it. Next time we're going to do it together, and um, and you know, so so no, we go on our own and we um, and we meet up with people. You meet amazing people, and, and, and just remarkable. They're you know, and, and and you're walking day after day after day. It's, you know, in, in the case of the Camino, if you do it from from um, the beginning to the end to Finisterre, you're going to go nearly 600 miles mm-hmm. and you're going to see, you're going to, you're going to get to know people and you're going to, it's a beautiful thing. It softened my heart. You know, I did it right after I retired because my heart got, got hard from business. You know, it did. Mm-hmm. And, I, and that was my fault. There's no reason to, it just was my fault. But when I went back to the Camino, Oh, I fell in love with humanity again. I think I could use that again. Did uh did do poems come out of that or Oh yeah. 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 I don't think any good ones. But boy, <laughs> they felt good out there, you know? Um I yeah. Um I can't recall me writing a poem that I've ever liked after getting home, but I loved them on the way I was on the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I should go back to them. I, I keep them. I, I thank you. I'll go back. Yeah, you definitely should. Um, so here's another question for you. So Daniel Mask asks, how has advertising influenced your poetry? And that's something we talked ah. about a little bit in the interview. Yeah. But you worked in advertising for something like 30 years or something. I did. I did. Um, thank and, you for that question. Yeah. 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 I, well, you know, with advertising, when you write a TV commercial, um, which is in my day, we was the, 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 a focal point with, with print and with radio, with outdoor boards. Now, of course, since, you know, we've had much more with the uh, you know, internet and social media. But in that day, you had 22 words to write a commercial on average, 30 mm-hmm. second commercial. And there were many 15 and 10 second commercials too. So concision would be one of the great issues. The problem with advertising is that it tells you, it tells you what it told you. And, and, and so you repeat and you hammer and you have a message and you become, it becomes on some level a rant. But it's there to sell something. And, the, and so they're, they're similar in the fact that they, you want a short, you, you have to be concise, but they really diverge in the fact of their purpose. One is exploratory for me. What do I feel? What do I think? Let's find out. The other one is to change your mind about something, mm-hmm. change your behavior. So while we're using the same 26 letters in the, in the English alphabet, um, so there's commonality. They're too close. They're too much alike. and They're too far apart. So on some level, I'm still suffering from that. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I feel like um, lately you know, people ask me a lot um, if there are trends in poetry, you know, and I would say um, that being more political is um, a sense of, of, of some way the poetry has been changing more lately. Poetry is getting more and more political. And as a result, it's getting more and more. Um, there are more poems that are trying to persuade rather than to explore. 
And I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, you know, in, in an advertising sense, kind of, uh, you know, like like the way an ad would try to explain, persuade you of a certain point of view. A poem uh, sometimes tries to persuade you of a political point of view. Do you ever think, um, in terms of that, do you ever try to persuade somebody with a poem? No. Yeah. I do not. I, I, I think I have an aversion to such. First of all, I, I come to the page and I leave the page unknowing. Um, I, I would like to persuade them that this happened, this moment actually happened, that the, that the waitress, you know, that my father sits as long as he went never changes the, the settings. That, that never happened, not to my knowledge. Um, some of the story about the, the political stories, um, I think that that's probably in the evolutionary uh, stages that we're in with, with, with political poems. It's going to change. You're going to become better poems that are political. Mm -hmm. And so right now there's there's this there's this need to get something across. Okay, fine. Not that the need will change, but I think that the craft will change, and perhaps we'll find that by not being so strident, we will in fact achieve the goal of convincing people. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Like you know, like you have to sort of convince people at an angle, at a slant, to actually get through their uh, armor of uh, what's that the the what's that called the, the backfire effect you know yeah so yeah. so in a way poetry works better as persuasion when it's authentic i think maybe mm -hmm. um, here one more call one more hang up and call you back okay oh, you froze okay again. <laughs> okay <clears throat> and we right back with michael mark All right, and you are back. <laughs> good to see you moving again. Yeah, good to see you. Sorry. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but it just happens sometimes, but it doesn't matter. Uh, do you want to read the next poem? I think religion is next on your Yeah, list. religion. Um, and I call this a queen's poem, but there's really no reason to call it a queen's poem. This is just how we think. Um, uh, you know, we're careful with our money. We're care we don't want to waste, and that's how I grew up. Um, and um, so this is called religion. You have to squint these days to taste the berry in the blackberries. And still you eat even the bad ones. All because the date on the package has passed. It's a morning for toast, cold in the house. You want the low sugar bread with avocado, sea salt, and tomato. But they'll keep one more day. On the calendar, in tomorrow's box, you write avocado toast. By evening, you're bullied again by what feels like religion. This you must eat now. That you must let die a little more. You know you have saved enough not to live this way. You hold the last blackberry away from your mouth, stare into its countless lightless eyes, and wait for what you've been raised to believe is the proper time to wait. Yeah, and that was from Salamander. That was Religion, another mm. poem by Michael Mark. Um, so this issue that we did the interview for, it was a tribute to neurodiversity. Yeah. And, uh, and you have dyslexia, uh, mm -hmm. which is what, you know, what qualified you for that section of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, what is it like right, like right now to read a poem um, in public? Is it, is it difficult that way? Or do you memorize it well enough that you don't have to worry about that? Um, you know, um, when I'm reading... Out and using my mouth, when I speak it out, uh, it's much easier hmm. because my mouth slows it down. And I know that I'm trying to be articulate and I have, you know, I want to make sure that I'm clear. So I slow down. And everything slows down. And therefore, the, the, the words would normally, not, but oftentimes, run along the page and they switch around and they go off the page and they really are like ants going, going kooky, you know, or being ants. But it's hard to concentrate, and so I'll and so I'll pick up things from from the from the right page or the left page. See, I, I went, see, what I just did. I moved to the left and called it right. Yeah. So so um, yeah. It's it, But right now, um, and when I have anxiety, it, 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 it exacerbates it. And you're making me very calm, and I'm happy to be here. And so I'm feeling kind. Uh, calm and you're being kind to me so thank you <laughs> no my, my pleasure michael um uh, let's see so so somebody asked earlier um about if you have any mentors and mm. somebody else just just a moment ago 
asks, uh, says, uh, this is Daniel Mask again. I guess I'm calling out Daniel Mask a lot today. Uh, he says, so much of what, uh, how he writes reminds me of Merwin, especially the ending. He says, Merwin influenced his writing and, um, and, and just in general, to answer well, some of I'm blushing. <laughs> Who asked that question? That was Danny Mask again. Danny. Um, Your new best friend. Yeah, well, I thank you. <laughs> and um, I am a big fan of Merwin's. And um, I, I want to one day I want to go visit his his place out in, in Hawaii where he's grown those trees and, and spend time. Um, so thank you so much for that. It's very touching. Um, I, of course, I, I, I love him, and, and, and I'd love to, that, 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 that that comes out in my poems. Um, I feel like um, I, you know, I've studied with some fantastic poets. I mean, uh, I got a chance to meet Stephen Dunn, and he, I feel, is a mentor. And that was based on, 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 on Rattle, where I read a, an interview that you did with him, and, and I called you up. I said, is he a good guy? Because he's, he's one of my favorite poets, but I'm tim- intimidated about meeting him. And you said, no, he's a good guy. So I reached out to him, and I, and I got a chance to work with him for three days at his, in his house, and, and, and that was amazing. Um, I feel like um, I, I feel like I... I have a lot of mentors. I feel like, uh, you know, Zimborska, um, uh, you know, I, and even, you know, I have, I have somebody who I, I work with, uh, Gordon Kippler, who's somebody I share with, and, and Jim May, this remarkable poet. He actually, he won the, um, the Rattle uh, uh, po- Prize for... Yeah, um, the, yeah, the Reader's Choice Award. And he yeah. has helped me so very much. I mean, I mean, I can go on and on. Um, John Gardner has helped me. Um, I think um, I think of myself as somebody like Blanche Dubois, I said it in the interview, uh, through the kindness of strangers. So I learn from everybody, um, and um, and I've had, I have a lot of teachers. Yeah, yeah you, you mentioned uh, your friend Gordon Coppola, uh, who yeah. uh, is here frequently, and uh, he has a great question for you. Is there a poem you want to write that you haven't been able to write? Oh, Gordon, <laughs> why do you have to trip me up in front of everybody? Um uh, is there a poem I want to write? I suppose there are poems I want to write, yes. Um, but I'm not going to articulate it, not to be clever, but, but I feel that if I put it in any form, uh, if I put it with words or sound, it will drive it. And I don't think I'm ready to do that yet. Mm-hmm. But thank you, for, uh, <laughs> thank you for driving me towards that opportunity, Gordon. Excellent. Thanks. Let's do well. We have uh, two more poems left. Let's do one poem, a couple okay. more questions, and a last poem. Okay, great. Uh, this is this is showing another side of me. You've met my family, and this is a this is a more wacko side. And I apologize to my family if if if, if, if I put them in a, uh, in a bad position. This doesn't name anybody, but uh, it does it does volunteer who I think I am behind behind the scenes. Um, it's called "I Like When the Serial Killer," and the first the, the title goes right into the poem. I like when the serial killer is. I'm sorry. I like when the serial killer in the movie is a good family man, a slightly overattentive dad who gets flustered helping his kids with their grade school homework at the fold-out kitchen table each night. And they make fun of him. They call him Mr. Goonie because he fears his answers are all wrong and he doesn't want to hurt their futures and his wife wants to crawl inside him gushes how he's more patient with the kids than she is and nobody in the whole world knows her man with the gentlest little bunny heart what would she do if something happened to him she looks up with her watery christ-lighted eyes and begs please don't die first kill me first be merciful instantly he knows how and where and with what but what about the kids he whispers She grabs him close, wraps her legs around him while the children do their math and spelling. I don't care. Kill them too. Mm -hmm. And that is, I like when the serial killer from Two River Review by Michael Mark. Thanks for sharing that, (laughs) Uh, Michael. We have a whole bunch of questions. So so the questions started coming in now. All right. Um, um, so, like, like, why don't you shut up? <laughs> no. Okay. No. So, Richard Westheimer asks, uh, "Does your dyslexia influence physically how you write, as in using a keyboard rather than a pencil and paper?" Oh gosh, I, I, I do. It's funny you say pencil. You didn't say pen. How did you know? You spying on me? I, I, this is scary. I use pencils, um, and I don't know that it affects me. Um, it affects me most when I'm reading. Um, 
And um, so I don't know that, I, I don't feel it when I'm writing. When I'm writing, I feel like I'm, I'm getting at it. I'm kind of stamping it when I'm getting it. So um, I don't know. And the key, I, I often do use voice. I mean, the, a lot of time my first iteration will be speaking into my iPhone. Hmm. And, I, and then it does the dictation. And, um, and then from there, I'll, I'll start to, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on, the, uh, on, on my keyboard, uh, on, my, on my Mac. And then, I'll, and then I'll, I'll, I'll work on it. Then I'll print it out if I think it's worthwhile. And then I'll start to work on it with my pencils, you know, different, different times. And then I'll go put it back in or I'll read it again. That's how I work. Yeah, uh, staying on the, the dyslexia topic, uh, S- Sally uh, Prangley says, have you ever written a poem about your experiences of having dyslexia? The way you describe the words traveling over the page was so visually descriptive. Do you have any poems about that? Gosh, I don't. <laughs> but, I, but thank you for the inspiration. I'm yeah, serious. Well, I think I, you should. I, 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 I think I'm gonna. <laughs> and then we'll do one last question um, before the last poem. Uh, okay. So John uh, Wiesick asks, have, has your advertising background influenced how you publish and market your poetry? Which is a different question than, than we asked yeah. earlier. Right. Um, and yeah, so, so does that influence you at all? I sort of have a theory, which I just came up with, but we'll see what you say. Okay, you have a theory? <laughs> you're going to tell, tell the theory after I speak? Yeah, go ahead. you want to go first? Yeah, go ahead. All right. I think I'm cognizant of that rejection because in advertising, you get told no a lot. You get told no all the time, I suppose. But in advertising, you bring them work and tons of it, and they go, no. Uh, can you think about it this way? Can you think about it that way? So in, in hearing no as much as I hear from, from the journals, um, I don't take it personally. I, I, I say, hey, what, why do you think they said no? And maybe I can make it better. As far as publishing, I just say, you know, if they say no, somebody else may say yes. And that has happened. Um, so um, I just, maybe it, it just taught me to have a thicker skin, perhaps. Hmm. Yeah. So, so what I'm thinking here, because we've sort of hammered you a little bit over that you don't have a book of poems oh, yeah. out. <laughs> and I'm wondering... If understanding market forces and like the economics of poetry leaves you less enthusiastic about publishing, knowing how small, you know, because you've, I don't know what accounts you worked on in advertising, but these Big are products that, I, that reach millions of people, I assume. And poetry is such a absolutely. small. Absolutely. I'd be able yeah. to afford. Yeah. Yeah. So, so is there a sense that you compare? No. Uh, no? Your theory is wrong. Okay. Well, I'm glad <laughs> to have it falsified. But, but, but I, I, think, I think the reason why I haven't had a book is A, I think I'm getting better. Mm-hmm. I'm 64 years old. Who knows how many times, how, how much more I got going. I mean, I may. My dad's 95. I hope I have his genes. I definitely don't have his brights. <laughs> I, I think that um, I want to be a great book. And I also think that looking and coordinating the manuscript is terribly intimidating. Perhaps that's an answer to the dyslexia because I cannot even visualize putting all the papers out and going, yeah, this one's two, this one's four, this is 16. That just drives me crazy. And I'd rather write a new poem. Mm -hmm. I like poems. I think I write, I think I read poems and I write poems. I don't read books of poems. Maybe that's a problem for me. And I don't write books of poems. Um, but I'd love to have a good book of poems. So uh, one last one last hang up, and I'll call you back. Hang on a second. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's get get Michael back here really quick. Okay, you're back. So just to follow up on that, um, yeah. do you have a manuscript that you're working on at all? Um, do you have any ideas for how to put your poems together? Um, I, how far along well, are you on that process? And how can we encourage you to, to make it Thank you. I, I tell you something that's very touching because I really do want, I, I know, I know and Lois wants me to have a book and she, for myself and my kids do, I'm sure. Um, to, and, and my dad, I mean, no, I do. Um, do I have a manuscript? No, I don't even have page really one. I'm, I, you know, Blast is, is pushing me and bless this man, this gifted man and, and tender man. And, 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 and he, he's, he's putting, he wants me to put the, the, the book together and he's helping me. He sees I'm struggling and he, and, and, and so I'm trying to him and I thank you for your pushing. <laughs> I really do. I, I, you know, I do. I so, so what about a, a book of the guru poems? You know, you got a lot, so many gurus. Oh, oh no, listen, it's possible. It's possible. 
I don't know. <laughs> so I, one last question is, what <laughs> is it about the guru that keeps appearing? What, what do you, what do you, um, yeah. what, what is that to you? It's almost like an archetypal figure of the guru. Yeah. In your yeah, yeah, yeah. I think more is the, the, that's the word that came to me more. There's more than what you're seeing, Michael. Hmm. No, step this way. Step, step lightly, step firmly. There are doors. Trust. You know, live your life fully and, and, and beneficially to all. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that was a good answer, but I, no, I, I no, felt that. No, I can see that. Answer. Like thinking about it that way, he's like kind of like the force that spurs your poems forward into the no. into the into possibility a little more. Mm. Uh, well, we have uh, we're kind of out of time. But do you want to read the last poem you had here? Would you like me to read the last poem? Okay. I would. I would uh, love you to. Okay, this the last one's called "If I Say," right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. good. Uh, and this is again for my dad for his birthday. Happy birthday, Dad! I love you. If I say the butterfly is beautiful, Dad. He'll say it's a bug. If I say it likes him, he'll say, who needs friends? If I say once it was a caterpillar, he'll say next it'll be dead. If I say it's a symbol of change, he'll inch his butt to the bench's edge, rock back and forth, back and forth, like the physical therapist taught him to get momentum, to stand safely, then after three settling breaths, he'll turn and start shuffling toward the car. If he's feeling steady enough, if the breeze isn't too hard, he might spread wide those bony elbows, look back at me, and flap them. Nice. That is from Sugar House Review. If, if I Say the Butterfly is Beautiful, Dad. Uh, by Michael Mark. Michael, thanks so much for being a guest today. It's always it's just an honor just talking to you. I always feel good about it. I really appreciate your presence. Uh, thanks for being here and sharing these poems with us. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for so much of my life, Tim. Really, you really, and for the community you build. I mean, it's, it, it, it's a magnificent magazine, but the community that you build and foster, uh, I think is really healthy for us at this time. So I thank you. Well, that, that's great to hear. Thanks, Michael, and have a, have a good night. Bye. Bye. Yes, yeah, so that was Michael Mark uh, from Randall Number 71. Uh, with uh, reading uh, 10 poems I think he shared and a lot of interesting conversation. Uh, always a pleasure talking to Michael. Now we're going to take a quick break and go to the uh, open lines. And let me uh, pop this down for just a second and show you how to do it. So if you'd like to share a poem on the open lines, you can share anything you'd like. You can share a poem you've published recently, share a poem you wrote recently. There's a prompt every week. And the prompt this week was, let me show you really quick. Um, i got to get over to this screen. The prompt for this week was here. Um, it was to uh, this Lit Hub article details 32 the 32 most iconic poems in the English language. Read or reread a few, or all of them, like me, if you can't stop yourself because it's too much fun, and write a poem that replies to one of these works. And then there's a link there from Lit Hub. That was the prompt this week. If you'd like to share a poem like that and uh if you did whether you did this or just like to share something else anything is open this is completely open lines email the poem you'd like to read or a link to where it appears online to open mic at rattle.com that's open mic at rattle.com then you can pick either the phone or skype if you'd like to appear on video it has to be skype send me a chat message to rattle poetry all one word that's rattle poetry all one word just say hi i'll wave back i'll call you when it's your turn that's how you sign up for the open lines if you'd rather do it by phone, the number is 818-850-7727. That's 818-850-7727. Just let it ring a few times and hang up. You'll also appear in my call list that way. And uh, that is how you get on the open mic. And I'll call you back when it's your turn. I do everybody who uh, has uh, the first-time callers, I'll do first. And then the veterans after that to make sure we get everybody new in. It's always great to see new faces. Um, so please do share and share whatever you would like. Now, uh, I'm going to take a quick break, get a couple things set up, and I'll be right back. Oh, yeah, I forget. In, in the intro, I like to say the uh, next week's guest. And next week's guest is going to be Martin Willits Jr., a poet out of Sy Syracuse, New York. Uh, a whole bunch of uh, books he's published. 
His most recent is Harvest Time, which is just out. He was in the uh, postcard poems issue with a funny postcard poem about Syracuse, New York. That cracks me up just thinking about it. Um, he also teaches writing workshops uh, for free. We've donated uh, books for him for that project a number of times. Really interesting person, great poet. That is Martin Willits Jr. next week on Rattlecast number 93. Now I'm going to take this little break. I'll be back in about 30 seconds. I'm just getting everything set up and stretching my legs. Refill your glass. Uh, do whatever you'd like to do, and I will see you in just a few seconds. And I'm back. Thanks for your patience as I uh, get everything set up. We have uh, at least two first calls. We've got a 502 and a 606. I will call you in just a moment. Uh, one thing I should let you know before I do, that there's a delay on the stream. So when I call, make sure you hang up or mute the stream you're watching this on, because uh, otherwise there'll be two Tims, 30 seconds apart, talking to at the same time, and it is very disorienting. Uh, it's just like one of those radio call-in shows where they say there's a delay, so uh, make sure you mute your, your stereo, turn the volume down, do the same thing here, because otherwise it's really hard to talk. So uh, make sure you do that, and I will give you a call in just a moment. But now let's do uh, me and mine and Megan's poems. Um, so as I mentioned, the prompt this week was to uh, write a poem um, that replies to one of these poems that are the 32 most iconic poems in the English language. Um, and my poem uh, replies to one of those, which was the uh, William Carlos Williams poem, The Red Wheelbarrow, which, of course, uh, everybody knows. But just in case uh, listeners don't, I'll, I'll share this one since it's short. Uh, here is William Carlos Williams, The Red Wheelbarrow. So much depends upon the red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. And, of course, the, it's one of the most iconic poems in, uh, in the English language. And, uh, I don't know, the, the interpretation to me is always that, uh, about how much, um, how much of human civilization relies on simple tools, basically the wheel and the lever and the barrel for collecting rain and how our survival depends on those simple things. I don't know. I've seen other interpretations of that poem too, but the poem always reminds me of, um, a different wheelbarrow. And, uh, here was my short poem based on that. This is The Red Wheelbarrow as well. The Red Wheelbarrow was really blue and more a cart, regardless of the hue, and you were dead. You left it by the shed, filled with scraps of wood. What it was you meant to do was likely good, but that part I only knew about as well as I knew you. And that is The Red Wheelbarrow, a poem for my grandfather. Um, he was sort of a very quiet man. I never got to know very well. But here's a picture of me with that wheelbarrow slash cart. Um, that's me when I was three years old, maybe. And that's my grandpa. And behind him is this wheelbarrow. And after he died, this was just left out by the shed. And for some reason, that image always sticks with me. And um, and uh, William Carson Williams always makes me think of that poem. So so that is my my share for today. Um, and here is Megan's. Megan uh, went with uh, Dylan Thomas's "Go Gentle into That Into the Good Night." Is it the Good Night? "Go Gentle into That Night." Man, I'm such a bad poetry editor. I can't even remember the the title of that famous Dylan Thomas poem exactly. But uh, here is Megan's "Take No Weapon into That Good Night." Here she goes. Take no weapon into that good night. Take no weapon into that good night. Death has never needed this display. Close your eyes when you blow out the la the light. 
Your past is an unstitched quilt, despite whatever you did or did not say. Take no weapon into that good night. Only fools are consumed by how bright their star burned. You lived day after day. Close your eyes when you blow out the light. Wait at the, wait at the end. It all seems so trite. A few bursts of color, mostly gray. Take no weapon into that good night. The human heart is a constant fight. No more are we predator or prey. Close your eyes when you blow out the light. At last be gentle with all your might. The love we leave never goes away. Take no weapon into that good night. Close your eyes when you will blow out the light. That was Megan's poem. Uh, another great one by Megan, as always. Take no weapon into that good night after Dylan Thomas. And let's see what you have for us. Um, let's go to, we'll go to those first-time callers first, because I already warned you about the, the delay. Let's go to the 502 number, and we'll see who I can surprise tonight. Hey, this is Tim with Rattle. You are live on the air. Who am I talking to? You're talking with Linda Gowen. Hey, Linda, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Let me uh, let me pull it up here. Okay. Um, and so let me f- try to find your poem. Um, yeah, I did the uh, response to Read a Dove. Ah, I see it here. Excellent. And uh, why did you pick that poem? Um, it's been a favorite of mine for a long time. Rita Dove is one of my favorite poets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's and, amazing. And uh, I have a daughter, and, you know, it just, she resonates. A lot of her poetry about her family, her daughter, resonates with me. Excellent. Well, uh, I'll be getting up on screen right now. Uh, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. After searching the Bible for tips about exposure. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and of her daughter. My daughter was nothing like Rita Dove's girl, a three-year-old who spreads her legs to discover her vagina. My offspring sought ghosts, Carrie's bloody hand shooting up through the soil to seize air, a poor lass slighted by a mother who didn't dare look at her own anatomy, who wore Leviticus 1817 as a dressing down. I guess you could say I'm nothing like you, Rita, a woman who mirrors confidence. I never reflected on my daughter, who never asked to see me. Naturally, my mother said nothing is innocent, and her lesson was a geranium-stained rag protruding from the trash, a scream. Her tight-fisted lack of words in response to my query was not the best script for our stories. Like you and your child, Rita, we three sought the pink, but blood knows better. Uh, Excellent poem. Linda Gowen, after searching the Bible for tips about exposure. Thanks so much for sharing that, Linda. Uh, Thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. My pleasure. Okay, let me put Linda, too, in the uh, address book really quick so so we know who that is next time. There we go. And that's Linda Go. In, go, G-O-I-N, in case you want to find more about Linda and her work online. Uh, let's see. Next, we will do the other the other number that we have completely new. This is a 606. We'll see who that is. And I think it might be Lori Zlantara. We have, that's a new name that's on here. We'll see. Hey, this is Tim with Rattle. You are live on the air. Did you have a poem you'd like to share? Uh, I did send it in, too. It's, Excellent. I hear um, myself in the background, so just mute that really quick before. I'll mute you for a second while, uh, while you do that. Excellent. Okay, and who am I talking to? Lori Ziantara. Ah, yeah, that's who I thought it might be. And where are you calling from? I'm calling from Olive Hill, Kentucky. Ah, great. Excellent. I, I forgot to ask... Uh, uh, Laura Gowen, where she was calling from last, but uh, but that's great. Uh, and what what did you write about? Actually, it was after reading the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T. S. Eliot. It has nothing to do with anything he wrote, but for some reason, this just popped out of my head. 
Well, interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this. So it's definitely a response, though, a spontaneous, a creative response. Let's hear it. Okay. It wasn't the World Series, but my heart was broken in the seventh inning when the crack of the bat split the air with a supersonic surprise. I wasn't ready. Cracker Jacks and hot dogs smothered in mustard and onions would never taste the same. You walked up those steep steps at the height of the game. You said you ran into your first love. If it hadn't rained that day or I'd stayed home patching and mending, I would have never seen the change come over the game from that seventh inning. I handed it off at the bottom of those stairs. And at the last play before the eighth, knowing the game was impossible, I would never win. We left my heart in left field, well-grounded, but broken like the field torn by runner's cleats. You left me at the top of the ninth before the game could be fully played. Oh, great poem. Excellent extended metaphor there. Uh, that was Lori Zintara. Thanks so much for calling and sharing that, Lori. Oh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to share it. Yeah, definitely. My pleasure. Hope you can call in and share another one soon. Wonderful. Thank you. Yep. Good night. Good night. Yeah, I love that poem. I always love a baseball poem. Like, similar to golf. You know, like, it's famous for uh, there being a lot of baseball poems, but it really aren't that many. Let me just add um, Lori into our phone book, too, so we know what next time she calls. Uh, let's see. So those are the two first-time callers we had so far. Let's get uh, Gordon Coppola next. Uh, we already mentioned him as one of uh, Michael Mark's good friends. And uh, let's call him up. Uh, here he is, Gordon Coppola. Good evening, Gordon. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I just... You're good. You're live and your your audio and video are working good, so you're all good to go. And I remembered because the sun is over there and it's <laughs> up here, and I, I noticed when I rewatched the thing, oh my gosh, I had all this sun going <laughs> into your face, so I turned myself around this time. <laughs> I like it. Well, no problem. I was just sort of admiring. I was imagining you were like in Hawaii or something. That's, yeah. that's what I was thinking. But it is the latitude. You're up north, which makes it uh, the, the sun change a little bit more. Right now, for me, we're also in the mountains, so we got the sun... What's that word? Where the sun just bounce? You know, we get the shadow really quick, and then the sun bounces off the mountains. Um. Anyway, what uh, what did you want to write about? What was your? Uh, I'm I'm a big Lewis Carroll f fan, uh, mm -hmm. so uh, I did mine on Jabberwocky, and this has a little explanation at, at top. Uh, after Lewis Carroll, way after Lewis Carroll, the less censored story emerges of what really happened after our hero used his vorpal sword to snicker snack the Jabberwock. This is called Jabberwocky Talk. Excellent. The Jabberwock came fluming back to life from vorpal surgery. Its eyes were nymphomaniac for beamish little me. I love a man who snicks the sword as snackerly as you, my dear. A plumy hero leaves me bored like Fleem the puppeteer. I borbled Fleem and also flum the blows and puppet Fleem controlled. I banged my triumph on this drum. Let's bang before we're old. I'm flattered, winsome jabberwock. I crooned with sweet sincerity. My heart is in a butterlock. I'm seeking clarity. Anatomy is my concern, what yours might be and how will fit. My private glamp needs fuel to burn, it's not a hypocrite. The monster sloughed its outer shell and zim-zammed in the nude. Signor, one beau, mademoiselle, vera solimitude. The jabberwock and I hooked up and splurved our days in sweet delight. There never was a spooning up that shammered near so bright <laughs> that was excellent thanks so much for sharing that it was hard to hold in my my laughter there <laughs> it's a good poem <laughs> thanks tim appreciate it bye yeah thanks gordon have a good one you too bye yeah i love some jabberwocky and some jabberwocky talk i think that was gordon coppola uh with that poem uh let's see next up you know i'm gonna do something a little different this week i'm going to um 
Oh, wait, no, actually, because I only have one. Never mind. I was going to tell you the prompt a little early and then share a couple poems, but I realized one of the ones I was going to show you wasn't actually, didn't actually work for it. So scratch all that, and let's just keep going with the open lines. Uh, let's call up next. Uh, let's call up uh, Danny Mask, who uh, featured prominently in the chat questions. Hey, Danny, how you doing tonight? I'm doing great, man. Doing great. Good show tonight. Yeah, Michael's just a lot of fun. I, I met him. He comes oh. to our uh, literary festival all the time, which is how I met him for the first time. And he's just a great person. Um, but what do, you, what do you got for us? Yeah, maybe you need to help him get a poetry book together, man. I'm trying, think, I'm uh, trying to push help. him. He's got he's to make a book first and <laughs> make some manuscript going. But uh, yeah, we'd like to. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a great poem by Megan. I I, my, I named my son uh, Dylan Thomas, oh, by really? the way. That's oh. how much I like him. <laughs> Very cool. I think, uh, I don't know about his son, but we have, uh, we have a Dante and a Dinah as our cats, and the next one may be Dylan. <laughs> that would make sense. Um, okay, so uh, so what do you have to share? This is uh, There's a photograph with this. Yeah. Um, I live... Uh, we live we live in houses that sit on a water table and they have these uh, irrigation ponds that mm -hmm. are surrounding. Um, and uh, so um, we noticed a uh, a huge alligator in one of them the other day. And I and I and I made a I made a remark that that sparked a poem. So here's the poem. Excellent. We're looking forward to see it. We we all saw the picture. That's a little little frightening there for a for a northern and a western kind of person like yeah. me. Well, it, it's like a common occurrence here. Um, um, so I call this when we have no unkind children. We call them no see -ems. tiny winged Houdini smaller than time. They slip easily through the delicate mesh and bite when there isn't an ocean breeze. We have bigger flies too that bite even when there is an ocean breeze. And we have alligators. Here is a picture taken yesterday of an alligator afloat in the pond near my house. It's at least six feet long. It waits sanguinely for a stray dog or a young child to get too close to the lush, grassy edge. The law says not to feed alligators. Parents feed them anyway. We have no stray dogs or unkind children in my neighborhood <laughs> <laughs> another one I, I try to hold in uh, hold in my reactions to the poems, but, but that one got me too i did not see that coming um how often do the how often do the alligators attack like do they take dogs a lot like we have the mountain lions oh, here no, which is I a big problem that up. i made that okay I made that up. <laughs> that's well good. you know i wouldn't put a dog close to, i mean that's a big ass alligator yeah you know? six and, feet. Uh, they're hungry yeah so yeah, yeah i would uh <laughs> <laughs> Well, our town is a, is a smorgasbord for the for the mountain lions right now. So uh, <laughs> it's like the well, buffet. We live in a fifty-five plus. We live in a fifty-five plus community. That's why there's no children. But <laughs> I, that was the comment that I made. The alligators are eating all the children. <laughs> well, that was a funny one. Thanks for sharing that, Danny. Thank you, Tim. Great yep. show tonight. Yeah. Thanks. Have a good night. You know, buddy. Bye. There's Danny Mask with uh, "We Have No Unkind Children." <laughs> Okay, um, let's see. Next up, we will call. Um, let's hit Nivedita. Hopefully, uh, we can catch Nivy before uh, she has to go to work. We'll see. Good morning, Nivedita. How are you doing today? Hey, Tim. I'm doing great, thank you. How about you? I'm doing excellent. It's been a, been a really fun show. What do you have to share with us? <laughs> Um, I chose Dylan Thomas's poem as well. Excellent. He seems to be a popular choice today, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a, it's definitely a, the best poem of resilience, I think. There aren't that many poems of resilience. So. There are. Most of them are sort of, I think, as poets, we tend to write about the saddest stuff and things like that rather than taking a positive spin on mm -hmm. pessimistic things. So I think this is sort of one of those few poems that does that and does that well, I might add. For, for sure. Yeah. Well, let's hear it. I got it up for everybody. Okay, great. Thank you. Go gentle to greet the new dawn. After Dylan promises to not go gentle into that good night. Please go gentle to greet the new dawn. Ranting and raving never prolongs the night. 
accept the inevitable with dignity and calm. The wise men definitely had it right. When they knew their efforts extended the misery, they went gently to greet the new dawn. Those good men who never shed a tear and know they're off on the next big adventure accept the inevitable with dignity and calm. Those foolish men who embrace the sun in their strong arms, refusing to leave even when it's set, finally understood and they went gently to greet the new dawn. These wise men, so near death yet so bright, spread their peace to those around as they accept the inevitable with dignity and calm. And you, you sit there on your perch up high, sad to see yet glad to know that that wise old man accepted the inevitable with dignity and calm and went gently to greet the new dawn. Uh, Navita Karthik, thanks so much. Excellent advice in that poem. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tim. It's lovely talking to you, too. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. Yep, have a good morning or day. Thank you. (laughs) Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was Navita Karthik with Go Gentle to Greet the New Dawn. And uh, we have a whole bunch of people. Um, Let's see. I don't even know who to do next. It is a... I don't think we're going to be able to get to everybody today, unfortunately. Uh, But let me see. Let me read... Um, let me read Carlton Johnson's poem really quick. He wrote one after the Wastelands a response. Here we go. This is Carlton Johnson's poem. The Wastelands a response. Thomas says April is the cruelest month. I remain unconvinced, but then 2020 was the cruelest year, at least in recent memory. The powers that be in their austerity, garbed in white with stethoscopes, and little black bags helping, always helping us, who were isolated and bereft of small, simple pleasures, keep their scripts and lozenges close. This turbulence that set down April last, or March, or February, no matter, we all have lost count of the hours, the minutes, the pains, the death. Oh, the death bringing end to the miserable, consumptive lives spent on death's door with a hose and a pump providing air of some sort. But is this living? It is certainly cruel. The last resort, still this apri, not the cruelest, and yet. It is finally a year of relief, of greener leaves in spite of the endemic disease, and the many that will still perish in spite of vaccine. April is not the cruelest month, nor are any of the other twelve. Each month can be a savior, with hugs of hope, or a Judas mugging you of your time. Your money, your life, year and year out we struggle and survive the wastelands of tomorrow. Ah, the wastelands of tomorrow. Great last line there. That was Carlton Johnson with the wastelands. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carlton. Uh, let's call up, uh, let's do Brent Stoffer next. Hey, Brent. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Can you hear me? I can. You are all set up and good to go. So uh, what do you have to share for us tonight? Awesome. Well, um, I, I was, I, I, uh, am responding uh, to, uh, the red wheelbarrow, Mm -hmm. uh, William Carlos Williams, uh, poem. Um, I had initially thought that I would, um, respond to 13 ways of looking at a blackbird Uh and then so what i'm what i decided to do was to do 13 ways of looking at a red wheelbarrow Mm -hmm. um i had read the the i had read something about the william carlos williams saying that um the uh, um that the the inspiration for that poem actually came out of his uh, love for this um, this guy uh, Thaddeus Marshall. Oh, really? Hmm. Who, who who he knew, and he was in Thaddeus Marshall's house, looking out of his window, and and saw that scene. Um, previous to that, people had theorized that since he was a doctor, that there was this rumor going around that, that he had been at the bedside of the sick girl, mm-hmm. huh. but he later on anyway. So that's kind of, 
and, and so, yeah, I thought it was interesting. And I also thought that um, – that I would take him a little bit to task, just just a, just a little bit, but uh, yeah. So okay. that's 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 what's going on. Okay, well, the good doctor <laughs> is in for it. Let's hear what you got. <laughs> yeah. All right, thirteen ways of looking at the red wheelbarrow. One, black ink firmly fixed to a white sky. Two. Breath becomes words which sound and follow each other through the air and into the ear. Three. They used to say a dying girl gave Williams the rain-glazed great American image. Four. Now we know a man named Thaddeus, ankle-deep in cracked ice, packing porgies in Gloucester, was the father of that limitless metaphor. Five, the poet places red forms next to white ones. Six, he lets the rain fall on everything and then waits. Seven, so much depends upon the absence of Thaddeus. Eight, the poet names the wheelbarrow and chickens into existence. Nine, those dinosaurs cluck and peck their crumbs off the damp ground. They shiver in their clouds of feathers. Ten, the rain flung itself across the never-ending redness of the ideal wheelbarrow and now reclines over its gleaming surface like an invisible and exhausted maiden. Eleven, I look for the love of Thaddeus, his calloused black hands, his ankles blue from cold among the sparse lines. Twelve, the said and unseen, the unsaid and unseen hover above the words with their infinite silence. Thirteen, the wheelbarrow and chickens are seen through a window framed by rain riddled panes. Oh, excellent. I love that. That was, uh, so, 13 ways of looking at the red yeah. wheelbarrow. Great, great <laughs> mashup by Brett Stoffer. <laughs> Thanks for sharing awesome. that. Thanks, Tim. Great show, by the way. Yeah, really yeah, inspiring. I'm having a good time. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, have a good night. Thanks, Thanks Tim. See you. See you. Yeah, Brett Stoffer, 13 ways of looking at the red wheelbarrow. And uh, let's see. Next up, we'll call oh, Nate Jacob. I don't know if, uh, yeah. A first-time caller. Sorry, you know, Nate Jacob is, um, we'll do Nate next, just so he's not surprised. Uh, but the, uh, he's been on the, the comments so much that I didn't, I didn't realize he had never called in, but he hasn't. So we'll do Susan Talley, then we'll do Nate Jacob. Hello, Tim. Hey, Susan. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. I'm just making sure that I'm turning off the sound. Well, I don't hear anything. I think you are good to go. Okay. Um, I wrote a poem because when I was very... Hey, Susan. How are you doing? Oh, I guess I do hear I'm myself. Good. Hang on. Hit, hit mute on that. We were asked to do a parody, mm-hmm. and I picked um, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. Oh, great. Hello? Yeah, yeah, we're ready to go. So so it's uh, on Easter Sunday, I Wandered Lonely. Um, I have it up yes. on the screen. And, and that, that's based on a poem. Who, who wrote that poem? Um, William Wordsworth. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. Can I ask you a favor to read it? Because I have it on my cell phone and I can't see the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no problem at all. I'll just hang up and read it for you then. I really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, Thank no, you. no problem at all. It's always, it's always my pleasure. Have a good night. Though. I'm so glad you could share something. Okay. Yeah, so again, this is uh, Susan Talley. And uh, the poem is right here. On Easter Sunday, I wandered lonely. <clears throat> These congregants in this flower bed may have inspired Wordsworth when they were his host of golden daffodils. I bend down to listen, their brilliance beams higher than human flowers in dialogue with God. But they remain a clique standoffish, 
on church steps and the spirit of Easter visitors gather together in modest conversations. I could smile and walk their way, but I remain challenged by a host of yellow tulips with not a word for me. Oh, that was great. I love that ending. That last couplet's great. That was uh, Susan Talley with On Easter Sunday, I Wandered Lonely. Thanks so much for sharing that, Susan. And uh, now I will call up uh, Nate Jacobs. And here he comes. This is Nate. And Nate looks like he's got two short ones for us. Hey, Nate, so glad you could join us. Hey, Tim, it's good to be uh, finally yeah. in, in contact. You know, yeah, you great uh, um, critique of the week commenter. And so oh, I, I, I just thought that you uh, had been on before, but I guess you haven't. <laughs> I have not. I've, I'm a little shy usually. Yeah, well, I'm so glad we get you. So you did two, two short poems. You want to explain I, why and, and what you did? Well, the why is actually because they're such uh, short responses to <laughs> gotcha. such short poems. Uh-huh. So. I uh, figured I'd go with the red wheelbarrow and then the, uh, uh, I don't actually remember the full title of the Gwendolyn Brooks poem, but we be real, mm-hmm. I think it was be real cool. Her line was. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, first I'll go with, uh, William Carl- Carlos Williams. Poem. Okay. I, the borrowed wheelbarrow, please return it. The red wheelbarrow. I need the chicken coop and the pig run to be cleaned out as soon as the rain has stopped. Besides, I never said you could borrow it. <laughs> that was a good one. I liked it. <laughs> okay. And, and then, then uh, yeah, what's the other one? Oh, go ahead. Uh, the, the next one I called, uh, We Jazzed June as Seven Old Pool Sharks by uh, responding to Gwendolyn Brooks. Uh, we are nearing 80. We still, sink, still stink at pool. We strain to hear the jazz. We drink right through our past. We scratch too often. We let life soften. We didn't die soon. We are still at that same saloon. <laughs> Everybody's uh, very light and fun today. Thanks for being sure of that, Nate. I'm glad I could. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Yeah, it was Nate Jacobs with two uh, two fun ones. Yeah, I love the fun poems. Um, let me fix my camera. It's getting dark in here. Um, a little brighter. Okay. Uh, okay, let's go to next. Oh, we have another uh, first-time caller at a uh, 970 number. Let's see who that one is. For maybe Bill Heater? Hey, Tim. Hey, Bill. Yeah, you're live on the air. Uh, this is Bill Heater, I assume, right? No, this is actually Nate Jacob again. <laughs> oh, it's Nate Jacob. <laughs> yeah, I, I've okay. tried every way possible. Cause yeah, I was, uh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Okay, see ya. Okay, so maybe, uh, let's see, what is this? So Bill Heater just said something. This is a poem from Michael Mark's friend. I'll give Bill, if Bill, you're here, I'll give you time to uh, call in and get on the call list. If uh, not, I'll just read it for you a little bit. Um, let's see, unknown person. Just trying to make sure it's not one of these ones I missed before we move on to uh, more on the open lines. Let's see. Oh yeah, so this was Nate Jacob. Let me put that. I'm gonna I'm gonna add Nate's phone number so that we don't get confused again by that number there. Okay. There we go. And, uh, okay, so I'm going to do, let's call up, uh, let's call up Spartacus in the UK. Spartacus is right after Sappho. Hey, uh. Hey, Spartacus, how you doing tonight? I'm ready to boil in here, Yeah, it, you know, it is late there, isn't it? What time is it where you are? It's um, very early in the morning. Oh, yeah. yeah. Are you a night owl usually, or do you stay up just to, to yeah. join us? Um, so I responded to a poem of mm-hmm. Sappho, which uh, was translated in English. And there is one more poem of Ovid that um, 
Um, I don't know if you know about Ovid. He wrote some poems called Heroites. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they are uh, some sort of letters, and they are um, poems from women addressed to uh, the men that abandoned them. Mm-hmm. So it's quite interesting because, again, it's about um, um, literature and uh, poems uh, responding to each other. Yeah, very interesting. Well, it's let's go with yeah. all this. Yeah, well, why don't you go ahead? It's uh, Anonymous Poet, 2021 AD to Sappho. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Mm-hmm. Sappho, verses, I remember as songs on people's voices, even as fragments. When the epic past becomes the moment of birth of an erotic, lyric present. Sappho, love, was a dismal, battling Troy in which armies of lovers had victories or defeats or made peace with their mortality. My Aeolian news, then imagine that there was beauty in charioteers, foot soldiers and ships. You could see more than them. Beautiful for you was its desire of the people you love and their Sublime memory in your poem could overcome physical separation. Your desire for closeness could embrace everyone's emotions and your words were attracted to each other by heroes. My muse, Sappho. Troy is the dark night and your fame is the light of the flame in your heart that cannot hide its betrayed ruins. Faun, the favorite ferryman of Aphrodite, would never come back for you from Etna, but you would always be the womb of Ovid's poem, Heroides. Penelope realized that the reason for Odysseus' return was his desire to listen from her lips that Ithaca is the most beautiful of sights that the dark earth offers. Excellent. That, that felt like Sappho, too, stylistically. Thanks for sharing that, Spartacus. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, it was great night tonight. And uh, have uh, a lovely night. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Yep. Good night. Yeah, there was uh, Spartacus and Agnostris with uh, Anonymous Poet 2021 AD to Sappho. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more person. Um, sorry we're not going to get to everybody uh, this week. There are just uh, too many people this week. I guess it was a, very, it was a popular prompt. Um, but let's call up, try to see who we haven't had in a while. Looking through. Uh, Joey Stahl hasn't been on in several weeks. Let's call up Joey. And that'll probably be the last one we get to today. Uh got to put the kids to bed. Megan's out dog sitting. So the kids are staying up a little late tonight. Oh. Hey, Joy, how are you doing tonight? You're live on the air. I am tired. We had our middle school science fair today. Oh, yeah. And I always get roped into judging. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like fun to me. Uh, who, who won? What was the uh, What was the project that won? Uh, chest circumference and lung capacity. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. I asked him afterwards, uh, what did you find out? And he said, it, it, it only works if the person is in shape. <laughs> <laughs> That's very fun and interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Joy. Uh, what yeah. poem do you have for us? Well, uh, I kind of read the prompt wrong, uh-huh. uh, it, but I think it still works. Okay. Uh, so, uh, when my young, when my oldest child was about seven years old, he said to me, no mom is an island. Uh, so I had a immediate mind picture and it's kind of reflected after no man is an island. By oh, John that's Dunn. great. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And perfect for, uh, for Mother's Day week too. Yes. No mom is an island, ever by herself. Every offspring wants a piece of her content. 
a part of her regard. If the dishes be washed and dry by tea, her work is no less. As full as an employment were, as full as bathroom privacy ends, or of her clothes washer. Any child's need diminishes her because she is involved in her kids, and therefore never send to know for whom the child calls. It calls for mom. Oh, excellent little poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Joy. Thank you. Yeah, have a good night. Hope you get a good night rest, too. Thank you. <laughs> good night. Good night. Yeah, if your Joyce poems tend to be short, so let's do uh, let's do one last uh, poet. Let's um, let's call up. Um, try to find somebody who hasn't been on in a while. May fourth. Just bear with me for a second. Okay. Uh, yeah, Patricia. Well, okay, Patricia Rockwood is the. Uh, <laughs> the one who has been on the longest. Let's call it Patricia as the actual last poet. Oh, Patricia's got a short one too. Hey, hey. Patricia, how you doing tonight? Hey, Tim, I'm good, thanks. Uh, if you want to come out of video, uh, you got to click the button. Yeah, I just have to. I have to wait till this box goes away. There, yeah, just... there you go. Yeah. Um, so, what did you uh, what did you write in response to? Um, well, like um, three other people, I chose the red wheelbarrow. <laughs> yeah, that is the most tempting. It's sort of a the, you know, it's a poem you remember the most. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I just changed it around a little bit. I really loved, I love the images in that poem so much, mm -hmm. and um, um, so. Um, and not not to analyze it too much, but I really I love William Carlos Williams's uh, statement about no ideas but in things. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so um, I just um, kind of changed it around a little bit to the things that that inspire me the most, which are the birds in my backyard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, let's hear it. I'm looking forward That's to it. it. It's called the Blue Bird Bath. <laughs> Um, I'm waiting for the way at dusk, the red cardinals call to one another, then drop with a flutter of wings in the blue bird bath. Oh, I love that. Very, very beautiful, <laughs> simple poem. Thanks so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Yeah, good, night. good night. Good night. <clears throat> that was Patricia Rockwood, who you can find at patricirockwood.com with uh, the blue bird bath. And that's going to be it for uh, for the open lines tonight. Like I said, I got to get the I can't let it go over tonight, uh, but let me um, pull up the prompt for next week, and I'm going to share an example of it, too. That was my plan. And the prompt for next week is going to be here, once I drop everybody down. The prompt is to write a reverse poem, a poem with lines that can be read both forward and backward. Um, and here is an example of a reverse poem. This is uh, one of our favorite poets, and uh, Lynn Knight, who uh, was the guest on Rattlecast number, I don't know, she was the guest back in, I don't know, maybe like 20, some episode. Hopefully she'll put out a book and we'll have her back on again. She's one of my favorite poets, but this is um, Lynn Knight with While Plum Blossoms Sweep Down Like Snow, and this will give you the idea of how to write a reverse poem. Um, Lynn Knight mirrors it here, but uh, you don't have to. You can either you know, we can repeat it both ways, or you could just have a poem that could be read in reverse. Um, this is, well, plum blossoms sweep down like snow. Well, plum blossoms sweep down like snow. What you found was not... So there's a little bit of echo in that recording. I think it's an old one. I'm going to read it myself instead. While plum blossoms sweep down like snow. What you found was not what you sought. What you loved was not what you thought. White plum blossoms sweep down like snow when it rains. The seasons don't know the names we use. I loved you then, he said, meaning never again. Plead with him all you want. It's through. Your turn to decide what to do. 
Your turn to decide what to do. Plead with him all you want. He's through, he said. Meaning, never again. The names we used. I loved you then, when it rained. The seasons don't know. White plum blossoms sweep down like snow. What you loved was not what you thought. What you found was not what you sought. That was Lynn Knight uh, with While Plum Blossoms Sweep Down Like Snow, an example of a um, reverse poem. And I spent a lot of time trying to find this poem right before the show. Um, this is from the Young Poets Anthology. And I thought this went both ways. Uh, but instead, it's a poem um, it's supposed to be meant, it's meant to be read from bottom to top. This is Eva Hayes, age 14. And since I took the time to find it, and was thinking about it, I thought I would share it, even though this does not apply to the prompt exactly, because you'll see it doesn't actually read, um, it doesn't actually read both ways, which is the point. Uh, this reads up instead, but it was still an interesting, fun poem by uh, Eva Hayes, 14-year-old poet, uh, can't remember where she's from. This is Background Thoughts, and you have to read it going up. Note, this poem is meant to be read from the bottom up. So I'll read this poem really quick uh, from the bottom up, just to close out the show. What I say doesn't really matter, does it? I understand it's hard to know what someone else is feeling when their words have faded into the background noise, but you'd think one would notice when they're standing up on others to get a better view. I hoist you up way over my head because what's the point? You're going to climb anyway, and I wonder if by the time you reach the top, you'll realize. So there's a poem being read up which is sort of, even though it's not a reverse poem like the prompt, it kind of shows you how you can play with going in reverse order and what that can do with a poem. That was, um, again, Eva Hayes from uh, Rattle, the Young Poets Anthology, 2018. Uh, Eva said, Poetry is a great way for me to express myself. Whenever something is bothering me, I pull out my journal and jot down a poem. I love any type of writing, but I can really hear my voice through the words that I write in my poetry. That was Eve Hayes. And uh, it's another poem I thought I would share that would be uh, interesting. And so once again, the prompt for next week is to write a reverse poem, uh, which is a poem with lines that can be read both forward and backward. And, uh, and next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be, as I mentioned before, Martin Willits Jr. Uh, Martin Willits, is, we've published him, we started publishing him in issue number 23. I think we've had him uh, maybe in three issues of Rattle. And then a few times in the Ekphrastic Challenge, he really participates in that. I think he does every month for the last five years. And uh, we've, so we've published several of his poems there as well. His newest book is Harvest Time. And uh, we'll be looking forward to talking to him Tuesday, May 18th on Rattlecast number 93, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Hope to see you then, and I hope you have a great night. Good night. <laughs>